start today kind of the groundwork of uh, an, an, an interaction that Jesus begins to have with a, uh, a series. It's three different individuals. Um, and um, we're going to look at sort of their response to Jesus and then Jesus' direct question back to them that was exposing an area of limitation in their life. But before we get into the actual application or the framework of Luke chapter 9, let's take a step back and let's look at sort of the bigger picture of what was happening here. We know if you're familiar with the scripture at all, you understand that when Jesus came to the earth as a child, wrapped, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger, we all know this Christmas story as it's been told, the nativity scene, all of that. And then we know that after that, um, he kind of goes into obscurity and hiding for safety as he's whisked away uh, af as uh, on the direction of the angel of God. He's whisked away uh, by his father and uh, his earthly father, Joseph, and his mother to Egypt, where he stays for uh, several years in, uh, in, in isolation and protection. Then he's brought back home. And when he comes back home, he's, he's, I mean, this kid is a prodigy. I mean, he is an absolute prodigy. Uh, and at 12 years old, we find him sitting with some of the elite minds of the day and they're blowing them away at his knowledge and understanding and grasping of the scriptures. And then something sort of uh, unique happens, really. In the framework of Jesus' 33 and a half years on this earth, uh, over half, uh, really half of the, over half of those years, we know very, almost nothing about. From the age of 12 to the age of 30, the only snippet we have of that entire 18 years is we do know he was a carpenter, so he had a trade, he used that trade, he uh, was making a living living by that trade. So we do know he was a carpenter, we know he had a mother, we know somewhere in that period of time his father died. We know that Jesus had siblings. The Bible alludes to some of them, in fact, but we don't know if that was all of them. Was there more? We don't know. We do know through sort of extrapolation that there had to be some difficulty in his past because of the circumstances by which he was born sort of in this illegitimate way uh, or even if it was uh, by society standard through Joseph, it, got, it happened before they were married. So there's a stigma to his birth that he had to grow up in a, in, with. Uh, and then the Bible just kind of gives it a summation of those 18 years and uh, simply says this, that he learned obedience through the things he suffered. That's it. That's sort of the summation of 18 years. And considering the importance of the life of Christ, the fact that, uh, um, you know, three and a half years of his life changed the world forever. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine that those 18 years seemingly to us had waste to them. However, we know if you've ever experienced God or have walked in, uh, walked with Christ, you know that God never wastes anything, anything, nothing with God is a waste. So we have 18 years of obscurity. And then we have this kind of launching onto the scene with the baptism uh, on, by the hands of John the Baptist and then the miracle at the wedding feast where he turns the water into wine and it's sort of like, boom. And then shortly after this, he begins to call these 12 men, fishermen, tax collectors, sort of the fringe, fringe people of society. He wasn't asking, uh, I've said this a lot of times, you've heard this, it's not original with me, but he didn't go to the uh, universities of Jerusalem. He didn't go to the, uh, the higher places of learning or he didn't ask around who was the most skillful, knowledgeable, um, you know, most advanced, most talented person. Um, he went to those who seemingly were on the fringe. Nobody knew them. Some brothers who were fishing. 
and more than likely, they're not, weren't the most successful fishermen. And so we find that's who he begins to select. So he, very quickly, he, he begins to create a following. And, you know, we, 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 in our day and time, have a better understanding of this phenomenon than maybe you would have said 100 years ago. Because we live in the age of the influencer, right? That's what they're called. You're not a, you're not, you're not a, a social media success, you're an influencer. So we live in the, in the age of the influencer. And we influence through our online platforms, whether you're an influencer on Facebook, you're an influencer on YouTube, uh, you're an influencer on Instagram or some other uh, social media platform, you're an influencer and you, you gain a following because of something that you're doing, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's inspiration, whether it's informative, uh, maybe you're just a, that interesting of a person that people choose to follow you because they just are uh, fascinated by your life. Uh, now we have people that literally travel and take pictures of traveling and type things about traveling um, and post it online and people follow them by the thousands. And frankly, 99% of the destinations that they're traveling to, you and I will never go to. But they're influencers, they're travel influencers, there's fashion influencers, there's uh, health and fitness influencers, there's political influencers. And so they gain a following because of this and, and we engage with them and, and it seems like, frankly, I don't know if you do this, but you go online and I just used Instagram as a platform, even though we're not on Instagram right now, we're on Facebook and YouTube, but you go on Instagram and you uh, look up and one of the first things you go is, how many followers does this person have? And you can pay for followers now, you can get, you can pay money and get more followers even though they're not even real people, your number can go up because the higher the number, the more successful you look. And then therefore, when someone comes, you don't have five followers, you've got 5,000 followers. You don't have 5,000 followers, you've got 50,000 followers. And you go up the rung until uh, you're someone like uh, some of the higher top people on Instagram, like a Dwayne Johnson, the actor who, I think he's got like 190 million people that follow him. And it's seeming, it, it, it seems like that, that these type things create an energy, a, a, a pull, a draw. We call it going viral, right? That's the term we use, right? Everybody, I don't have Facebook, but my wife does. And so I'm, I'm, I'm and then obviously with Antioch West, we have, uh, we're, we're on uh, as much as we can online. So I, I'm, not, I'm not ignorant of the way of the world. But there's some video of some child doing something or some animal doing something or some, some kind of cell phone video that someone happened to take at the right time and they post it online and all of a sudden, next thing you know, it gets shared, it gets reshared, it gets posted on this page, posted on that page. And before we know it, we call it, it went viral. And what that simply means is that all of a sudden this thing sort of takes a life of its own and just explodes and the views start stop being counted in the hundreds or the thousands. Now the views start being counted in the millions, sometimes even in the tens of millions. I'll never forget one of the first real viral phenomenons that really just blew up. And really when you look back on it, it was kind of like, wow, that was the thing that went viral. If you go back on YouTube, you can look at it up now. Uh, don't go back there now because you're supposed to be on YouTube watching me. So stop, don't go back yet, later. But type in Charlie bit me. You guys remember the, the, the video of the, of the baby sitting, of the two little boys sitting in the bathtub and the one boy puts his finger in the other boy's mouth and he bites and he goes, Charlie bit me, that really hurt. And this, these two British boys doing it. And the next thing I know, Man, that video, everybody was watching these two little boys sitting in the bath. I gotta be honest with you, I've got a bunch of funny videos of my girls and my son in the bathtub. I put it online, 
probably not gonna get a lot of views. But for some reason, that video happened to hit at the right time and became a viral sensation. Now, I'm not here to talk about social media. I'm using that as a, as a modern day example of kind of what happened a little bit with Jesus. Because Jesus, when he stepped on the scene and started doing miracles and started doing some things that were just absolutely beyond the scope of what any human had done to that point, Jesus went viral. If you don't believe he went viral, you had 5,000 people. 5,000. I know in our modern thinking, in our modern world where we have football stadiums that seat 100,000, the Super Bowl last week had over 90 million live viewers. 5,000, eh, not that big of a deal. But when you think about it in the framework of the ancient world, no microphones, no arenas, no padded seating, no cool video boards, no, uh, no insane sound systems. And I got another one for you, just kind of break it out for you. No bathrooms, no toilets. You got 5,000 people at least, and there could have been more. 5,000 people show up to hear Jesus teach. In fact, they were there for so long, they got hungry, and that's the story of the five loaves and two fish that Jesus broke, multiplied, and fed the 5,000. But think about 5,000 people show up to hear this guy talk. That wasn't a normal occurrence in the ancient world. Sure, the Roman Empire had begun to perfect the art of theater, had begun to create arenas for battle, but that was Rome. This was a dude out in the country that was a carpenter from the hills of Nazareth that showed up and people came out to hear him talk with no semblance of anything they were gonna get out of it other than to hear what this guy had to say. So Jesus started with these 12, but he went viral. Well. Let's be honest. It's one thing to observe. It's another thing to follow. So when you click on that button and every single uh, person that makes their living by the internet always asks you to do the same thing, either click and follow, like and subscribe, if you're on YouTube, it's, you know, make sure you hit that notification bell and you like and subscribe to this video so you know the next content. Or if you're on Instagram, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook, follow me. The problem with that is, are you really following them? Yeah, if they post stuff, sure, you'll, you'll look at it. Maybe you've got your, everybody has their favorite people that they follow whether it's a family member or maybe it's a, somebody on your Instagram page that you like the most, if it's uh, somebody that posts cool pictures or posts cool stories or whatever, so you're a follower of them. And I get the understanding you're following them, but, but are you really following them? Or are you just kind of observing their life? Because if you're following them, are you mimicking their life? Are you watching their every move? Are you trying to become like them? If you are, you might wanna hold your role we're only supposed to be trying to be like one person and they're not he ain't on instagram he's not on facebook and he's not on twitter he's the bread of life but when you look at that are you really following them or are you kind of giving are, are they are you watching what they say and you say well i like that click thumbs up ah that was okay i'm not going to say anything or maybe every once in a while that person you like said something and you click the thumbs down or God forbid they really do something squirrely and you unsubscribe or you unfollow. Oh, I didn't know unfollowing, unfriending has become a thing. When I was a kid, you know, we, we, if, if someone made you mad, you just got mad. Nowadays, I, my kids, so-and-so said they're, they're, they're going to unfriend me on the game. It's amazing now, we unfriend. Family members unfriend each other. I'm like, seriously? Is that where we've gotten to as a society, the way to get back at somebody is you unfriend them? Wow, we have really lowered our standards, folks. So when you say you're a follower, 
Are you really following them? Are you just kind of observing and liking or kind of thumbs up, thumbs down with what you like about, oh, that's good, man, I didn't like that. Ooh, I like that, somebody comment. Ooh, I like this picture. Oh, I like this. I'm gonna comment on their page. I'm gonna comment on that picture. I'm gonna comment on that photo. And that's kind of what we've learned and sort of the framework by which we kind of follow. And really, in some ways, it wasn't much different in the time of Jesus Christ. Now, we're talking about no limits. I know you're like, how in the world does this have to do with no limits? Remember, this is the opening, opening of the No Limits series. And, and when you look at this, you go, you know what? They weren't much different back then as we are now. Yeah, it wasn't through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, but there was a lot of viral. Jesus went viral real fast. He kind of like blew up on the scene and took off. And man, he was just like, everybody was trying to just clamor to a point that a dude was willing to climb up into a tree just to get a glimpse of him. Kind of like he was a celebrity. He was a, he was, he was just, you, even if he didn't do anything, it was like, oh my goodness. Wow. There you go. There he is. There's Jesus. I remember years ago, we were standing down at the White House. Uh, this was probably, oh, oh, it had to be, so 2000. So this had to be 98, 99, somewhere in that range. Standing out at the White House, looking. Um, this was back before 9-11, so the security wasn't as what it is now. They didn't have a bunch of barricades. So you, could, you could stand at that one fence right there on the, uh, what is that, the south lawn of the White House, and you could see sort of the, the 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 typical view that we all know of the White House, so sort of the curved colonnade of the porch that is the White House, sort of that iconic view. And you could stand there and you could look out. So we're standing there one day, and um, all of a sudden, there's this explosion of activity. And uh, all of a sudden, man, there's Secret Service guys come out on the roof, and, um, you know, they've got these... I don't even know what kind of weapons they were. They were they were weapons that weren't meant to, uh, uh, let's put it this way, they were weapons meant to do a job. <laughs> I don't know even what kind of weapons they were, but trust me, um, if, you, if you got hit by one of those weapons, probably not going to be a good day. And then all of a sudden, I don't know why we didn't see it at first, we started looking around, and there were guys standing in trees, underneath trees, hidden, all of a sudden, they started moving. You could see them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these, this line of limousines pulls up in front of the White House. And we knew. We were like, oh, man, I think the president's going to come out. He's, he's coming out. He's moving. And I, at that time, and still to this day, um, uh, I had never seen a president in real life other than television, you know, typical media outlets. I'd never seen one in real life. So I'm like, this is amazing. So we waited for a moment, and then sure enough, a few minutes later, uh, off of the distance, we saw this, this huge crowd. We couldn't see who all, because the crowd, the, there was a bunch of people, so we couldn't pick out the different faces, but we could see them move, and they get, in the, get into the, uh, to the limousine, and they all start to pull away. And so we, we took off running to the, to the, around the side of the White House down the street to get on that street where the exit is. And we stood there and sure enough, after a few minutes, the motorcade came out and within about maybe 20 feet, the presidential motorcade came out and sure enough, in the window right there was President Bill Clinton. And we were waving and he waved back. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's the president. We got to see the president of the United States. And Clinton drove by. He, didn't rem he doesn't remember that interaction. You asked Bill Clinton, remember that day that, that uh, you, you, you drove out of the White House about 22 years ago? Do you remember that guy standing outside waving at you? <laughs> it didn't mean anything to him, but to me, man, I was like, I got to see the president. I kind of think there was a lot of that going on with Jesus. There was a lot of people that were like, you know what? Oh, man, there's so many people there. Here, let's climb up this tree. Hey, let's climb up on this side of the wall. Let's, hey, let's get on the roof of our house. Wait a minute. Wait. <gasps> Whoa. There he goes. There he is. That, no, the guy right there. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that, that guy. He's standing in the middle. He's, yeah, standing in the middle right there. That's him. That's, that's him. Wow, look. Whoa. Can you believe it? That's amazing. There he goes. Wow. Can you believe 
do you, hey, do you realize we just got to see Jesus? Oh, that was amazing. We got to go tell everybody. And you run back to the house and you say, guess what happened? We just saw Jesus. You did? You talked to him? No, 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 no. We saw him though. He was like, he, he was way over there. He was about 50 cubits away. We'll use a good biblical measurement. He was about 20 cubits away. But we got to see him. We saw him. Wow. It was amazing. Now, that group that got those glimpses of Jesus or the group that was in the 5,000 did not experience Jesus like the 12 that walked with him every day that was experiencing them. They didn't experience Jesus like those who had this life-changing interaction. So there was this group that saw Jesus and this group that were becoming like Jesus. And in the middle, you had this you had this group that was trying to make a decision. And we come to Luke chapter 9, and that was a long intro to get to Luke chapter 9. But we come to Luke chapter 9, and we find three different individuals that were sort of a part of the outside group going, wow, there's Jesus, who are making a declaration that, hey, we want to be more than just fans. We want to be followers. We don't want to be thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, that's cool. Hey, you want to go hang out outside of Capernaum and listen to Jesus? He's going to be talking out there underneath of a tree. Let's go see what he has to say. Oh, that was good, Jesus. Appreciate it. Hey, let's go back down to the village. I got things to do. No, they were trying to become followers. They were trying to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And what an awesome desire that is, right? That's an awesome desire. We should all be desiring to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But watch the interaction that happens. You know it. You've read it. But I'm going to read it again. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 57 says this. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, now get this. They journeyed on the road, meaning they're walking. They had just left uh, one village going to another. They're walking on this road. And as they're walking on this road, Jesus walked with sort of this entourage. Not only did he have 12, but he had this surrounding group that came with him. We knew that there was, there was women in this group. There was other people that kind of came and walked with him a while and stopped walking with him. And then it was this sort of fluid movement around him of people moving in and out. And apparently this day, as he's walking from village to village, there were some guys in the crowd that day that were walking with him on the road. And one says to him, Lord! I will follow you wherever you go. Now that's awesome. When you think about it, great. That's awesome. I mean, come on right now. If you said, oh, Lord, today, I want you to know, Lord, with everything in me, I will follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go, God, I'll go. And man, if you heard somebody praying that, you go, wow, that is so awesome. Man, I, I love how they're turning over their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Wherever God goes, they said they're going to go. Man, that is awesome. I'm not making fun of that or saying that's a wrong thing, but that's what they did. What a noble word. What a, what a noble cause. Lord! And they, got, they must have said it not in a call. They, they must have been standing near Jesus enough to get his attention because when they said this, he responds back. Lord! Wherever you go, I will follow. And Jesus comes back to them in the very next verse and says, you know what? Awesome. Great. Let's go. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get in line. This is Peter. This is Paul. This is John. This is Andrew. This is Philip. This is Matthew. Um, a couple other guys. I don't know where they are. They're over here. But these guys are going to be your, you're going to want to stay close to them. Now, these are my selected 12. But I want you to hang out with them. They're going to kind of give you the lay of the land. And, uh, hey, let's just go see where this thing's going to go. It's going to be great. You're going to no. He turns to this guy who gives this sort of noble gesture of God. I want to follow you wherever you go. And he says this statement. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What? What? Okay, time out. Slow this, slow it down a little bit. Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Foxes have holes. 
Birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that a strange response? I know we read the scripture and we are, we read it so theologically and so we're like, oh, will we know what? No, but think about it. Just get out of your head for a moment. Go back to that moment. You just spoke to Jesus Christ with this sort of inspirational, Lord, wherever you go, I want to go. And he turns back to you and says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head down. I bet you if you were in the crowd that day and you heard that, you went, what did he just say? Did, what? Did he just say a fox and a hole and a bird and a nest? What? What in the world does that have to do with anything that guy just said? But you see, Jesus was doing something right away with this man. So the Bible doesn't say this, but I'm going to I'm going to extrapolate a little farther. I'm going to I'm going to read into the text. Now, this is my interpretation. I'm not saying it's right, but I I'm going to interpret it this way. There's no way if that guy had made a decision, wherever you go, Lord, I'm going to follow. There's no way he made that decision on the spur of the moment. Somewhere along the line, he had been exposed to what Jesus had done, what he was about. And somewhere along the line, he had made a journey from a outsider watching from a distance to now being a part of a crew that is walking right next to Jesus on the same road that Jesus is walking. So this guy had obviously had to make some decisions along the way to get that close. He didn't just run outside of his house one day, run up to Jesus and go, hey, I will follow you wherever you go. He was making, when he said, I will follow you wherever he go, he was saying, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to leave my career. I'm going to leave everything behind me, and I'm going to go wherever you go. That's what he was saying to Jesus. It wasn't just like this spur of the moment on a whim. Hey, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Let's go. It was wherever you go, I want to follow you to wherever you go. That was a, this, was, this was a life-changing, life-altering decision. But Jesus turns to him and says, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head down. Why did he say that to that man? Now we can interpret those words of Jesus in 5,000 ways. But for the context of no limits, right off the bat, Jesus recognized a limitation in this guy's heart. Because he said, Lord, wherever you go, I'll follow. Wherever you go, I want to go. And Jesus said, are you willing to go with me past the limit of your comfort? All of a sudden, Jesus tested the limitations that this guy must have had. Because when he said, foxes of old, birds have nests, son of man didn't, has nowhere to lay his head. He was saying, son, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to give up the limit of comfort in order to go where I'm going. You see, you want to follow me, but you have a limitation. Your limitation is you will go with me as long as it's comfortable, as long as you have somewhere to lay your head at night, as long as your pillow is soft at night, as long as the bed you're laying on is comfortable, as long as you have a roof over your head. But where I'm going, there is no hole, there is no nest, and there's nowhere to lay your head. So if you make that decision, it's got to be a decision with no limits. Before you make that decision, because if not, your limits are going to be tested and you're going to turn away. So let's just get straight to the chase now. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We don't know what happens, but our presumable understanding of the scripture is that this man must have turned away when Jesus gave him this because he was not willing to say, I will follow you with no limits. 
You see, true discipleship and true following of Jesus Christ is a relationship and a, and a, and a cost with no limits. You cannot put limits on discipleship. You cannot put limits on your relationship with God because if that's the case, God is going to test those limits until you finally say, no limits, God, whatever it takes. Or like this man, you walk away. Somewhere in the crowd that day, there was a guy standing. He heard this interaction. And no, this is the careful bar. You got to be careful of how you, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to wave at you. You had a floating fuzzball there for a second. You got to be careful when you observe someone else is areas of weakness and you presume because that's your area of strength that you somehow have beaten the system. Because watch what happens. There's a guy standing there, that crowd, and he's watching all this interaction and he says, and Jesus turns to this guy and said, you know, God says to Jesus, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus turns to him and says, you know, foxes have holes, birds have nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head down. And apparently this guy must have gotten a little depressed and walked away. And this guy is standing around watching this. And I bet you in his mind, he thought, I don't even have a bed now. I'm good. Oh, this is going to be cake. And Jesus must have discerned this and turned to him and said, hey, follow me. And all of a sudden, he panicked. What? Okay, okay, fine, fine. I'll follow you. Um, I'm okay, God. I'm okay with the with the bed thing. I, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not a big I'm not you know I don't need a select comfort. I'm good. So you know that doesn't bother you. But listen, um, my dad died, and um, I just need to run home real quick, and I need to bury him. I need to bury him. Um. So, you know, oh, I'm good. Hey, look, I'm good with the whole bed thing. The hole and the, and the nest, pfft, not a big deal. But look, just one little thing. I'll take care of it, and, and I'll go. If you don't mind, look, follow me. I'm good with that. Let's go. Hey, wherever you go, I'm going. Hey, you, you, me and Jesus, you, you, Jesus, you and I are tight. We're tight. We're like, we're, we're, we're buds. Just got to do one thing. Not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Got to run home. Um, got to take care of my dad. He died. Uh, and then I'll be right back. So stay right here. And Jesus wheeled it on him and turned and said, let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Whoa. That is a harsh statement from the God of love. Man, don't you know this guy is hurting Jesus? Don't you know this guy is suffering? Don't you know this guy is just dealing with a lot of grief? And that is a mean thing to say. But when you look at the context, I love biblical context. When he said, I need to go bury my father, do you know what that means? That when someone died, the Jewish ritual was that when you died, there was no embalming, there was no waiting around, that that person, if they died, had to be, uh, had to be put into a tomb in a very short period of time. And so because of the hardness of the ground, the rock, the, that, that people in that area were not buried in the ground like we bury our dead, six feet under. So most of the time, they were buried in what we call, what were called family tombs. We know this because Jesus was put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea had a tomb. Most of the time, we've done, they've done archaeological digs to prove this is the fact. This is not just theory. This is proven archaeological facts, is that these tombs, were usually not built for one person, but were usually built for a family because they had multiple shelves uh, cut out in the walls of the tomb to lay the bodies once they passed. And so once they passed, and go back, and we know this because they prepared Jesus's body the same way, they would wrap them in linen because Lazarus comes out, he's, he's wrapped in what, what was called grave clothes. They wrap the body in lemon, linen. They pr provide it with spices and things like that to, to, uh, to prepare the body. They lay that body in the tomb. The tomb is sealed. And depending on which study you look at, it was about a year's time that after a year after death, they would come back into the tomb. They would roll away the seal of the tomb and they would go back in and the body by that point in time would have decomposed 
to the fact that the only thing left were the bones. And you would take those bones and you would pl uh, bring them together and you would finally place them in a place of final, a final resting place and that would be called burying the dead. So when Jesus wheels on this guy and says, let the dead bury the dead, you're like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about, Jesus? This guy's hurting. Let the guy go home. And what's wrong with mourning the death of your father? Let him go back. Let him weep a little bit. You know, I'm going through some hard stuff right now, God. Give me some time off. Why would Jesus be so harsh to him? But really what Jesus was saying is, listen, your dad died. But I can be your comfort. I can be your peace. It's time for you and I to move forward. It's time for you to let go of the limits of your past to become, to go forward with me. If you want to follow me, you can't let your past limit you. And we're going to get into this farther in the series of how our past limits. But all of a sudden, Jesus, from the very onset, is asking this guy, follow me, comma, with no limits. And finally, the last interaction that we said. Now, two, two guys show up. One guy had the limit of comfort. The other guy had the limit of grief and dealing with death and how that compacted. And so finally, there's one guy sitting back. He's like, I don't, comfort, I can handle that. I can, I'll sleep anywhere. And, I, you know, I, grief past don't have that a problem so i got this watch me hey hey watch me i'm about to i'm about to, i'm gonna I'm show them how it's done lord verse 61 i will follow you but this guy is like look i know what's about to happen because the first dude said follow me and jesus asked him about his comfort the second guy jesus asked to follow and he said, hey, I got to bury. And Jesus is like, no, no. So I know how to fix this. I'm going to go ahead and just tell Jesus right up front so he knows. And then we kind of have this understanding. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. But before you ask, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to run home real quick. Tell my family I love them. Give my, give my kids a kiss. I'll be right back. And Jesus said, ha, ha, doesn't work that way. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. What? Again, Jesus is supposed to be love, compassion, and he sounds like a jerk. He tells this one guy, basically, suck it up, buttercup. There are going to be some days where you're not going to be comfortable. And he tells this other dude, by the way, don't go home and bury your father. Let the dead bury the dead. And then he tells this guy, you know what? If you follow me, don't be running home telling your family goodbye, kissing your kids and your wife. Because you know what? Because if you're going to put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Boy, that's harsh. Man, Jesus is a, who wants to follow Jesus? That's a terrible, what a jerk. No. Because every one of those guys was coming to Jesus Christ with limitations. The first guy, he had the limitation of comfort. He was okay following God as long as you didn't mess with his comfort. Because the moment you started making life uncomfortable, Jesus knew he was going to turn back. Quit. So Jesus said, if you're coming with me, here's how it's going to work. You're coming with me with no limits. Second guy, Jesus knew. Man, listen, this guy wants to follow me, but he's got a limitation of past and grief. If he doesn't learn to deal with that past and that grief, he'll never be able to go where I'm trying to take him because he's always going to have a limitation. And finally, the third guy, Jesus knew. This guy prioritizes his family above me because there's going to be a point in time where he's going to get news. Hey, come home. Your wife misses you. Your children need you. And if you're going to be caught in between me or your children, I'm not saying God wants you to abandon your family because I'm sorry. Let me just stop for a moment. There's some people that use God as a, 
as a shield to be bad husbands, bad wives, bad, bad parents. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't interact with my family because I'm always praying. Baloney. You're a bad father, a bad husband. I know that's harsh. Get over it. It's true anyways. Because Jesus wants me to be the love flow through me into my family. So I can't just say, well, I'm just too busy praying and seeking in the kingdom. The Bible says, woe be it if I preach, find myself a castaway. I say this all the time. Woe be it if, I, if all the world say, but my family inside this home is lost. So Jesus knew somewhere along the way there was going to be a conflict. Who is going to be more important, me or your family? Let's start with some limitations. So we have a limitation of comfort. We have the limitation of shame. I mean, of, of past and grief. We have the limitation of family. None of those are wrong. Jesus talked about how he was moved with compassion, with grief. He carried our grief. He bore our grief. He knows the pain. Some of you are dealing with the loss of a family member right now. God's not going, okay, get over it, buddy. Get over it, get over it, get over it. Suck it up. No, but there's a difference between dealing with your grief and your pain and that pain and that grief becoming a limitation. Because I've watched some who've lost loved ones, some that are watching today. I could begin to go through the list. Some of you know those that are watching today that have lost not just extended loved ones who've, who've lost husbands, who've lost children, yet they're still following Jesus with everything they had because even though they experienced loss, that loss did not become a limitation. I know people that are watching today and maybe we'll get a chance to share their story here in the next couple of weeks. We know people today that are watching that are dealing with extreme discomfort in their life, whether it's physical pain, financial pain, maybe they don't have all the the things of life, you hear stories all the time of people in horrible situations, but yet they give everything to God because it doesn't limit. They don't limit God through those areas. We know people today that are great moms, great dads, great husbands, great wives, but yet they don't use their family as a limitation. And I've seen people put their family above everything and in the end lose all of it because the family got bigger than God. You see, as we tackle the no limits, it's not saying that your limitation is wrong. It's saying that you cannot let what you're dealing with or what is in your life become the limitation. And that Jesus did not rebuke them for what they were doing and say that you're wrong. He rebuked them because what they were going through was becoming a limit. And Jesus wants to know, are you gonna walk with me with no limits? So as we start this series over the next several weeks, next week we're going to talk about, again, we're going to come back, we're going to talk about no limits when God says no. We're going to talk about is no and God saying no a limitation? Because when God says no, it either comes, we either take that as a something that creates limits or is God's no an unlimited, no limits response. But before we begin all that, before we get down on that journey, so many of you have said the very things that this man, these men said, God, I want to follow you. Wherever you go, Lord, I want to go. I want to be like you. I want to go. And he says, okay, fine. So in order for that to happen, I'm going to have to test every area of your life to see, are you willing to say, I'm going, no limits, no limits, no limits. You see, before you get mad at God, before you get bitter, before you start saying, why me, why this, why that, just stop for a moment and say, okay, God, I realize something. You're really asking me, are there limits? Because right now, man, we could go down the list. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up. We could go down the list today. We limit God in our time. We limit God in our talent. We limit God in our treasure. We, we tell God, we'll do this as long as you don't mess with this. 
God, I'll, I'll serve you here. Just don't mess with that area of my life. Don't ask me to forgive. Don't ask me to deal with that hurt in my past. Don't ask me to love that person because you know, God, what they've done to me. Don't ask. I'll do whatever you want, except. And you fill in the blank. You don't say that. We don't, we don't, we're not, we know we're not dumb enough to say those things. So what do we do? We wrap them up in noble answers. But okay, God, I'll do whatever you want. Just, I just need a minute. I got to go bury my father. God, I'll do whatever you want. I want you more than anything. So I'm just going to run home real quick and give my kids and my wife a quick kiss goodbye. And I'll be right back. We try to justify our limits to God by making him out to be God. You know what I've been through. You know how hard my life was. You know what I'm going through. And God in his love and kindness is not being harsh. He's not being judgmental. He's saying, yes, but you're not getting it. If you really want to be my disciple, you've got to be willing to say, I'll follow you with no limits. That's really what he was trying to get those guys to say that day. Forgive me for getting passionate here at the end, but I'm trying to share with you what Jesus is speaking in my heart about Joel and hopefully somewhere he's speaking to you about you. He's saying, I'm not just asking you to say, will you follow me? Yes, follow, that's fine. But will you follow me, comma, with no limits? If you really believe God is going to take us to where he's desiring to take us, where God changes the face of this entire world, he's going to be looking for people who are willing to follow him with no limits. Follow him when it doesn't look popular. Follow him when the road gets tough. Follow him if you may lose everything and not have a place to lay your head. Follow him if you have to deal with things of your past and hurt and disappointment. Follow him if that means there are going to be times where you're not going to be able to have the perfect family in the Instagram picture of all the things that you and your family are doing because you're following him with no limits. So before we get into specifics over the next few weeks and we start breaking down each one of these categories and we start talking about the specifics of the limitations in our walk with God and our discipleship journey, the very first thing we've got to start with is follow me, comma, with no limits. But God, I don't, I don't have any limits. Oh, wait, 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 before you say that. Oh, before you say that, yes, you're right. If I was sitting in that crowd that day, I don't, I don't have any limits. I'm good with wherever I lay down. I don't have any limits. My dad's still alive. And then he says, yeah, but you want to go back to home. Oh, 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 oh. Let's talk about where you lay your head down. Let's talk about burying your dad because I don't have those limitations. And Jesus said, yeah, that's not your problem. Let me talk about you. So before you go pointing your fingers and saying, I don't have any limitations, be careful because God's going to find your limitations because he already knows they're there. It might be giving up control. It might be your past. It might be a dream, a, a, a career, a future, whatever it is. Are you willing to follow him with no limits? If you want to have access to the unlimited God, you've got to give him an unlimited access into your life. If you limit his access, you limit his power. You can't have an unlimited God on a limited basis. I've said this before, I'll say it again. You can't have a full-time God on a part-time commitment. We love the fact that God's always there. He's full-time, but yet we want God to be full-time while we give him part-time. And we want God to be unlimited while we give God our limited. If you want access to the unlimited, you've got to be willing to come to him with no limits. So over the next couple of weeks, starting today, because I can feel God already challenging some of you today. I can feel the pricking of the Holy Ghost. Before you say, God, I'm willing to follow you, pause and finish the rest of the sentence. I'm willing to follow you with no limits. Because over the next couple of weeks, we're going to challenge that. We're going to challenge it in the Holy Ghost. How, how much do you really believe that? 
Because it's easy to say, God, I'm willing to follow you with no limits as long as we're talking about somebody else's limits. But somewhere over the next couple weeks, God's going to pinpoint your limit. And you're going to have to decide, I'm willing to follow God with no limits. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for this challenge that you're giving us in this application series of no limits. And Father, today I speak the seed of this word to find lodging into our heart that fruit would come in our life and through our life and by our life, but not for our sake, but because of you, for your glory. I give you praise and glory and honor today. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing I'm so full of faith and excitement today, not because of Joel. I'm so full of faith and excitement today because I know that you're at work. And I give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do because I know you're faithful. In Jesus' name, praise God. Don't forget Tuesday Talks. We're going into part one of the breakdown of we're going to talk about, again, remember the five, selfless, sacrifice, service, submission, and suffering. We're going to talk about selflessness Tuesday talks, 7.30 to 8 o'clock. Tonight, right at home, 7.30 tonight. Come hang out with us. We're going to have some fun for Valentine's Day. You're going to want to be a part of that. Have a few laughs. And then next Sunday, we're going to come back with our No Limits Life Application Series. We're going to talk about No Limits what do you do when God says no? God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Go be a part of your life group. If you're not a part of the life group, get involved in a life group because you're going to want to be a part of our series starting in March, The Life of Christ. And it's going to be awesome. So you, this is the time. It's the time. It's the time. Get a part, be a part, and let God work in your life. God bless you. Love you. Happy Valentine's Day. That's Amore, wherever you are. I hope you and your significant other have a wonderful day. Enjoy it. Have some hearts, some flowers, some chocolate, and have a wonderful day. God bless you. See you Tuesday. Actually, I'll see you tonight, 730, with my wife and I, uh, and hopefully Tuesday as well, 730, 8 o'clock. And if not, we'll see you back again here Sunday morning, 10 a.m. God bless you. Have a safe week in Jesus' name.